Omnilingual by H. Beam Piper, originally published in Astounding Science Fiction, February 1957, archived by Project Gutenberg. The Dane paused, looking up at the purple-tinged copper sky. The wind had shifted since noon while she had been inside, and the dust storm that was sweeping the high deserts to the east was now blowing out over Syrtis. The sun, magnified by the haze, was a gorgeous magenta ball, as large as the sun of Terra, at which he could look directly. Tonight, some of that dust would come sifting down from the upper atmosphere to add another film to what had been burying the city for the last 50,000 years. Red Lois lay over everything, covering the streets and the open spaces of park and plaza, hiding the small houses that had been crushed and pressed flat under it and the rubble that had come down from the tall buildings when roofs had caved in and walls had toppled outward. Here, where she stood, the ancient streets were a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet below the surface. The breach they had made in the wall of the building behind her had opened into the sixth story. She could look down on the cluster of pea-fabricated huts and sheds on the brush-grown flat that had been the waterfront when this place had been a seaport on the ocean that was now Sirtis Depression. Already the bright metal was thinly coated with red dust. She thought, again, of what clearing this city would mean in terms of time and labor, of people and supplies and equipment brought 50 miles across space. They'd have to use machinery. There was no other way it could be done. Bulldozers and power shovels and drag lines. They were fast, but they were rough and indiscriminate. She remembered the digs around Harappa and Mohenjaro, in the Indus Valley, and the careful, patient native laborers, the painstaking foremen, the pickmen and spademen, the long files of basketmen carrying away the earth. Slow and primitive as a civilization whose ruins they were uncovering, yes, but she could count on the fingers of one hand the times one of her pickmen had damaged a valuable object in the ground. If it had been for the underpaid and uncomplaining native laborer, archaeology would still be back where Winkleman had found it. But on Mars, there was no native laborer. The last Martian had died 500 centuries ago. Things started banging like a machine gun four or five hundred yards to her left. A solenoid jackhammer. Tony Latimer must have decided which building he wanted to break into next. She became conscious, then, of the awkward weight of her equipment and began redistributing it shifting the straps of her oxy-tank pack, slinging the camera from one shoulder, and the board and the drafting tools from the other, gathering the notebooks and sketchbooks under her left arm. She started walking down the road over hillocks of buried rubble, snags of wall jutting up out of the lowest, past buildings still standing, some of them already breached and explored, and across the brush grown flat to the huts. There were ten people in the main office room of Hut 1 when she entered. As soon as she had disposed of her oxygen equipment, she lit a cigarette, her first since noon, then looked from one to another of them. Old Salim von Olmhorst, the Turco-German, one of her two fellow archaeologists, sitting at the end of the long table against the farther wall, smoking his big curved pipe and going through a loose-leaf notebook. Ordnance officer, Sachiko Koromitsu, between two drop lights at the end, other end of the table, her head bent over her work. Colonel Hubert Penrose, the Space Force Commanding Officer, and Captain Field, the Intelligence Officer, listening to the report of one of the Airdyne pilots, returned from his afternoon survey flight. A couple of girl lieutenants from Signals going over the script of the evening telecast to be transmitted to the Sirena on orbit 5,000 miles off the planet and relayed from thence to Terra via Lunar. Sid Chamberlain, the Trans Space News Service man, was with them. Like Salim and herself, he was a civilian. He was advertising the fact with a white shirt and a sleeveless blue sweater, and Major Lindemann, the engineer officer, and one of his assistants, arguing over some plans on a drafting board. She hoped, drawing a pint of hot water to wash her hands and sponge off her face, that they were doing something about the pipeline. She carried the notebooks and sketchbooks over to where Celine von Olmhost was sitting, and then, as she always did, she turned aside and stopped to watch Sachiko. The Japanese girl was restoring what had been a book 50,000 years ago. Her eyes were masked by a binocular loop, a headband visible against her glossy black hair, and she was picking delicately at the crumbled page with a hair-fine wire in a handle of copper tubing. Finally, loosening a particle as tiny as a snowflake, she grasped it with tweezers, placed it onto the sheet of transparent plastic on which she was reconstructing the page, and set it with a mist of fixative from a little spray gun. It was sheer joy to watch her. Every movement was as graceful and precise as though done to music after being rehearsed 
a hundred times. Martha, it isn't cocktail time yet, is it? The girl at the table spoke without raising her head, almost without moving her lips, as though she were afraid that the slightest breath would disturb the flaky stuff in front of her. No, it's only 15.30. I finished my work over there. I didn't find any more books, if that's good news for you. Sachiko so took off the loop and leaned back in her chair, her palms cupped over her eyes. No, I like doing this. I call it micro jigsaw puzzles. This book here really is a mess. Salim found it lying open, with some heavy stuff on top of it. The pages were simply crushed. She hesitated briefly. If only it would mean something after I did it. There could be a faintly critical overtone to that. As she replied, Martha realized that she was being defensive. It will, someday. Look how long it took to read Egyptian hieroglyphics, even after they had the Rosetta Stone. Sachiko smiled. Yes, I know, but they did have the Rosetta Stone. And we don't. There is no Rosetta Stone, not anywhere on Mars. A whole race, a whole species, died while the first Cro-Magnon cave artist was daubing pictures of reindeer and bison, and across 50,000 years and 50 million miles, there was no bridge of understanding. We'll find one. There must be something, somewhere, that will give us the meaning of a few words, and we'll use them to pry meaning out of more words, and so on. We may not live to learn this language, but we'll make a start, and someday, somebody will. Sachiko took her hands from her eyes, being careful not to look towards the unshaded light, and smiled again. This time Martha was sure that it was not the Japanese smell of politeness, but the universally human smile of friendship. I hope so, Martha. Really, I do. It would be wonderful for you to be the first to do it, and it would be wonderful for all of us to be able to read what these people wrote. It would really bring this dead city to life again. The smile faded slowly. But it seemed so hopeless. You haven't found any more pictures? Sachiko so shook her head. Not that it would have meant much if she had. They had found hundreds of pictures with captions. They had never been able to establish a positive relationship between any pictured object and any pin printed word. Neither of them said anything more, and after a moment, Sachiko replaced the loop and bent her head forward over the book. Liam von Olmhorst looked up from his notebook, taking his pipe out of his mouth. Everything finished over there? he asked, releasing a puff of smoke. Such as it was, she had laid the notebooks and sketches on the table. Captain Gickwells started air sealing the building from the fifth floor down, with an entrance on the sixth. We'll start putting in oxygen generators as soon as that's done. I have everything cleared up where he'll be working. Colonel Penrose looked up quickly as though making a mental note to attend to something later. Then he returned his attention to the pilot, who was pointing something out on a map. Von Olmhorst nodded. There wasn't much to it, at that, he agreed. Do you know which building Tony has decided to enter next? The tall one with the conical thing like a candle extinguisher on top, I think. I heard him drilling for the blasting shots over that way. Well, I hope it turns out to be one that was occupied up to the end. The last one had it. It had been stripped of its contents and fittings, a piece of this and a bit of that, haphazardly, apparently over a long period of time, until it had been almost gutted. For centuries, as it had died, the city has been consuming itself by a process of auto-cannibalism. She said something to that effect. Yes, we always find that, except, of course, at places like Pompeii. Have you ever seen any of the other Roman cities in Italy? he asked. Minterne, for instance. The first inhabitants tore down this to repair that, and then, after they'd vacated the city, other people came along and tore down what was left, and burned the stones for lime, or crushed them to mend roads till there was nothing left but the foundation traces. That's where we are fortunate. This is one of the places where the Martian rages perished, and there were no barbarians to come later and destroy what they had left. He puffed slowly at his pipe. Some of these days, Martha... We are going to break into one of these buildings and find that it was the one in which the last of these people died. Then we will learn the story of the end of this civilization. If we learn to read their language, we'll learn the whole story, not just the obituary. She hesitated, not putting the thought into words. We'll find that sometime, Selim, she said, then looked at her watch. I'm going to get more work done on my lists before dinner. For an instant, the old man's face stiffened in disapproval. He started to say something, thought better of it and put his pipe back into his mouth. The brief wrinkling around his mouth and the twitch of his white mustache had been enough, however. She knew what he was thinking. She was wasting time and effort, he believed. Time and effort belonging not to herself, but to the expedition. He could be right, too, she realized. 
but he had to be wrong. There had to be a way to do it. She turned from him silently and went to her own packing case seat at the middle of the table. Photographs and photostats of restored pages of books and transcripts of inscriptions were piled in front of her, and the notebooks in which she was compiling her list. She sat down, lighting a fresh cigarette, and reached over to a stack of unexamined material. Off the top sheet. It was a photostat of what looked like the title page and contents of some sort of a periodical. She remembered it. She had found it herself two days before, in a closet in the basement of the building she had just finished examining. She sat for a moment, looking at it. It was readable, in the sense that she had set up a purely arbitrary but consistently pronounceable system of phonetic values for the letters. The long vertical symbols were vowels. There were only ten of them, not too many, allowing separate characters for long and short sounds. There were twenty of the short horizontal letters, which meant that sounds like ng or ch or sh were single letters. The odds were millions to one against her system being anything like the original sound of the language, but she had listed several thousand Martian words, and she could pronounce all of them. And that was as far as it went. She could pronounce between three and four thousand Martian words, and she couldn't assign a meaning to one of them. Selim von Olmhorst believed that she never would. So did Tony Latimer, and he was a great deal less reticent about saying so. Oh, so she was sure. Did Sachiko Koromitsu. There were times, now and then, when she began to be afraid they were right. The letters on the page in front of her began squirming and dancing, slender vowels with fat little consonants. They did that, now, every night in her dreams. And there were other dreams, in which she read them as easily as English. Waking, she would try desperately and vainly to remember. She blinked and looked away from the photostatted page. When she looked back, the letters were behaving themselves again. There were three words at the top of the page, over and underlined, which seemed to be the Martian method of capitalization. Star Norvad Tadavas Sornhuba. She wondered if it had been something like Quarterly Archaeological Review, or something more on the order of Sexy Stories. A smaller line, under the title, was plainly the issue number and date. Things had been found numbered in series to enable her to identify the numerals and determine that a decimal system of numeration had been used. This was the 1754th issue for Doma. 14837. Then Doma must be the name of one of the Martian months. The word had turned up several times before. She found herself puffing furiously on her cigarette as she leafed through notebooks and piles of already examined material. The Chico was speaking to somebody, and a chair scraped at the end of the table. She raised her head to see a big man with red hair and a red face, in Space Force Green, with the single star of a major on his shoulder, sitting down. Ivan Fitzgerald, the medic. He was lifting weights from a book similar to the one the girl ordnance officer was restoring. Haven't had time lately, he was saying, in reply to Sachiko's question. The Finchley girl's still down with whatever it is she has, and it's something I haven't been able to diagnose yet. And I've been checking on bacteria cultures, and in what spare time I have, I've been dissecting specimens for Bill Chandler. Bill's finally found a mammal. Looks like a lizard, and it's only four inches long, but it's a real, warm-blooded, gamogenetic, placental, viviparous mammal. Burrows and seems to live on what passes for insects here. Is there enough oxygen for anything like that? Sachiko was asking. Seems to be close to the ground. Fitzgerald got the headband of his loop adjusted and pulled it down over his eyes. He found this thing in a ravine down on the sea bottom. Ha! This page seems to be intact. Now, if I can get it all in one piece. He went on talking inaudibly to himself, lifting the page a little at a time and sliding one of the transparent plastic sheets under it, working with minute delicacy. Not the delicacy of the Japanese girl's small hands, moving like the paws of a cat washing her face, but like a steam hammer cracking a peanut. Field archaeology requires a certain delicacy of touch, too, but Martha watched the pair of them with envious admiration. Then she turned back to her own work, finishing the table of contents. The next page was the beginning of the first article listed. Many of the words were unfamiliar. She had the impression that this must be some kind of scientific or technical journal. It could be because such publications made up the bulk of her own periodical reading. She doubted if it were fiction. The paragraphs had a solid, factual look. At length, Ivan Fitzgerald gave a short, explosive grunt. Ha! Got it! She looked up. He had detached the page and was cementing another plastic sheet onto it. Any pictures? she asked. 
Not on this side. Wait a moment. He turned the sheet. Not on this side either. He sprayed another sheet of plastic to sandwich the page, then picked up his pipe and relighted it. I get fun out of this, and it's good practice for my hands, so don't think I'm complaining, he said. But Martha, do you honestly think anybody's ever going to get anything out of this? Sachiko so held up a scrap of the silicone plastic the Martians had used for paper with her tweezers. It was almost an inch square. Look, three whole words on this piece, she crowed. Ivan, you really took the easy book. Fitzgerald wasn't being sidetracked. This stuff's absolutely meaningless, he continued. It had a meaning 50,000 years ago, when it was written, but it has none at all now. She shook her head. Meaning isn't something that evaporates with time, she argued. It has just as much meaning now as it ever had. We just haven't learned how to decipher it. That seems like a pretty pointless distinction, Salim von Olmhorst joined the conversation. There no longer exists a means of deciphering it. We'll find one. She was speaking. She realized more in self-encouragement than in controversy. How? From pictures and captions? We found captioned pictures, and what have they given us? The caption is intended to explain the picture, not the picture to explain the caption. Suppose some alien to our culture found a picture of a man with a white beard and a mustache sawing a billet from a log. You would think the caption meant man sawing wood. How would he know that it was really Wilhelm II in exile at Dorn? Sachiko had taken off her loop and was lighting a cigarette. I can think of pictures intended to explain their captions, she said. These picture language books, the sort we use in the service, little line drawings with a word or phrase under them. Well, of course, if we found something like that, Von Olmhorst began. Michael Ventress found something like that back in the 50s. Hubert Penrose's voice broke in from directly behind her. She turned her head. The colonel was standing by the archaeologist's table. Captain Field and the airdyne pilot had gone out. He found a lot of Greek inventories of military stores, Penrose continued. They were in Cretan Linear B script, and at the head of each list was a little picture, a sword or a helmet or a cooking tripod or a chariot wheel. That's what gave him the key to the script. Colonel's getting to be quite an archaeologist, Fitzgerald commented. We're all learning each other's specialties on this expedition. I heard about that long before this expedition was even contemplated. Penrose was tapping a cigarette on his gold case. I heard about that back before the Thirty Days War at intelligence school when I was a lieutenant. The feat of cryptanalysis, not an archaeological discovery. Yes, cryptanalysis, von Olmhorst pounced. The reading of a known language in an unknown form of writing. Ventrist's lists were in a known language, Greek. Neither he nor anyone else ever read of a word of the Cretan language until finding of the Greek Cretan bilingual in 1963, because only with a bilingual text, one language already known, can an unknown ancient language be learned. And what hope, I ask you, have we of finding anything like that in here? Martha, you've been working on these Martian texts ever since we landed here, for the last six months. Tell me, have you found a single word to which you can positively assign a meaning? Yes, I think I have one. She was trying hard not to sound too exultant. Doma, it's the name of one of the months of the Martian calendar. Where did you find that? Von Olmhorst asked. And how did you establish... Here. She picked up the photostat and handed it along the table to him. I'd call this the title page of a magazine. He was silent for a moment, looking at it. Yes, I would say so too. Have you any of the rest of it? I'm working on the first page of the first article listed there. Wait till I see. Yes, here's all I found together here. She told him where she had gotten it. I just gathered it up at the time and gave it to Jeffrey and Rosita to photostat. This is the first I've really examined it. The old man got to his feet, brushing tobacco ashes from the front of his jacket, and came to where she was sitting, laying the title page on the table and leafing quickly through the stack of photostats. Yes, and here is the second article, on page 8, and here's the next one. He finished the pile of photostats. A couple of pages missing at the end of the last article. This is remarkable, surprising that a thing like a magazine would have survived so long. Well, the silicone stuff the Martian used for paper is pretty durable, Hubert Penrose said. There doesn't seem to have been any water or any fluid in it originally, so it wouldn't dry out with time. Oh, it's not remarkable that the material would have survived. We found a good many books and papers in excellent condition. Only a really vital culture, an organized culture, will publish magazines, and this civilization had been dying for hundreds of years before the end. It might have been a thousand years before the time they died out completely that such activity as publishing ended. 
Well, look at where I found it, in a closet in the cellar, tossed in there and forgotten, and then ignored when they were stripping the building. Things like that happen. Penrose had picked up the title page and was looking at it. I don't think there's any doubt about this being a magazine at all. He looked again at the title, his lips moving silently. Mastarnavod Taravas Sornhuva. Wonder what it means. But you're right about the date. Doma seems to be the name of a month. Yes, you have a word, Dr. Dane. Sid Chamberlain, seeing that something unusual was going on, had come over from the table at which he was working. After examining the title page and some of the inside pages, he began whispering into the stenophone he had taken from his belt. Don't try to blow this up to anything big, Sid, she cautioned. Have is the name of a month, and Lord only knows how long it'll be till we even found out which month it was. It's a start, isn't it? Penrose argued. Grotefend only had the word for king when he started reading Persian cuneiform, form. But I don't have the word for month, just the name of a month. Everybody knew the names of the Persian kings long before Grotefend. That's not the story, Chamberlain said. What the public back on Terra will be interested in is finding out that Martians published magazines, just like we do. Something familiar. Make the Martians seem more real. More human.